Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, um, for the really warm welcome. Um, should I dim the lights? There you go. Great. So I'm going to talk about energy and the Industrial Revolution. Unlike the other talks that I've given in this department, can you hear me, by the way, at the back? OK. Unlike other talks that are more scientific um, or engineering science oriented, this is going to be a little higher level, uh, more broader landscape of energy. So but before I start, I want to paint the picture a little bit of the history. So if you stop for a moment and go back to the time when the United States was being created, this is the time of George Washington and Thomas Jefferson in the 1700s, the Revolutionary War and everything. And imagine what life was like at that time. Of course, we didn't have photographs like this, but we had paintings. We had paintings. And what the paintings did, what they depicted, was life was like. And you can see George Washington on his horse, and you can see the lamp that is being lit by whale oil. That was lighting, and that was a mobility at that time using horses. And if you think about what has happened over the last 240 years or so, it has been one of the most remarkable periods of human history. Because we have gone from that, and a lot of things happen in between around the world, it all churned, and we are here. The Industrial Revolution, as I look at it, is from horsepower to horsepower. <laughs> we drive to the, to the grocery store with 300 horses packed in a little engine in the front of a car. I flew from San Francisco to here yesterday with 100,000 horses in about five hours, which would have taken months before. And that's what, that's what mobility has become. And during the times of Washington and Jefferson, this could not even have been imagined. And instead of lighting with whale oil, we have this today. So this has been an amazing period because if you look at the human history of 10 to 20,000 years, it's only the small slice of 240, 50 years or so that this has happened. Think about it. And this has led to a lot of our prosperity. This is our per capita GDP income across the world. And that has gone up exponentially. And what has also gone up exponentially is the use of energy. Because the Industrial Revolution is all about how we source, how we distribute, and how we use energy. And it's all mostly been about fossil energy. Another exponential increase, in fact, more than exponential increase that has happened, is that of population. In the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, we were 700 million people in the world, only 700 million. Today we have 7 billion. In fact, by 2050, we'll be 9 billion. By 2100, we expect it to be 10 billion. So if the first 240 years of the Industrial Revolution has been about using energy, mostly fossil energy, the natural question to ask is that if you want this exponential economic growth to continue, which is what we want, that's our quality of life. If you want that to continue, and with this increasing population, do we have enough fossil energy to sustain ourselves? And so that's the question out here. Do we have enough fossil energy to sustain our population economic growth? And the answer is absolutely yes. These are on the left-hand side is the global, um, global oil reserves. And the right-hand side is global gas reserves, natural gas reserves, without counting US shale. And you don't see a peak out here. The peak oil, there is no peak oil, because the technology for discovery and extraction not only keeps space, sometimes goes ahead. And that is what is happening. The amount of fossil fuel we have in our ground is roughly the same amount of oxygen we have in our atmosphere, because that's how the oxygen came, is from photosynthesis. So there's a lot of fossil fuel out there. In fact, there's, the question is about cost of extraction. That's really the issue, and that is cost is coming down. So we have enough fossil fuel. If we, so if we project ourselves going in the future, 
and ask the question, if this is the world we're going to live in, let's see what this world is all about. Let's look at the past and see, uh, is this the world we want to live in? Well, on the top side, the top graph out there is the global oil price. And what you find is that the global oil price, there are some fluctuations. And these fluctuations, so if you are in this world of oil, global oil price, we are going to live with these fluctuations. Where do the fluctuations come from? They come from events that are not in the United States. All these fluctuations happen because of events that happen worldwide, whether it's Middle East or somewhere else. And these fluctuations are bad for business because you can't plan. There's no long-term stability, and that's really bad. On the other hand, we, have, we import a lot of oil, and that imports, the fraction of our imports are going down. That's great. But that also, even if you count that, the, going, the reduction of imports, we're still buying about $300 billion of oil per year. It's almost a billion dollars a day. Now, we would love to use those $300 billion in our own economy and grow the economy, but that's not happening. And so, this is part of the life of living in the, under these conditions. And if you think that we are alone, think again, because China's uh, consumption has exceeded, has surpassed the production, and they're in the same world, so is Germany, so is many parts of the world of the developed economy and the developing economy where the consumption has gone beyond the production, and for, at least for transportation, we have only one fuel that we depend on, and that is vulnerability. Then, of course, we, have, we know now, and at least in the academic community, this is not an issue of debate, that when you burn fossil fuels, um, you emit CO2 in the atmosphere, and there's global warming. And, and there's isotopic evidence that that carbon has come from fossil fuels and not you know, other, by other means. And people talk about that since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, the temperature has gone up by 0.8 degrees. That's what we call the global warming, 0.8 degrees. Now, if I go on the streets of Detroit or Ann Arbor and say that, oh, the world has warmed by 0.8 degrees, people say, who cares? My house warms up by 10 degrees every day. And I think this misses the point of talking about the mean. I'm going to talk about the distribution, which will have the mean, but there's statistics involved. So what I'll show is data from the past of the deviations from the mean. And you'll see a nice Gaussian bell curve, which is normalized by the standard deviation, one sigma, two sigma, three sigma. Initially, you're going to see a nice theoretical curve, and then you'll see the data. And it's a movie. And what you're going to see is how this distribution changes. On the right-hand side is higher than the average, which is hotter. And the left-hand side is lower than the average, is colder. So things change. So let's look at that distribution. This is averages and, and extremes. So let's play this movie. So there it is, 1950s and 60s and 70s, you'll see. And it's fluctuating. You have equal number of hot and cold summers. And look where this distribution is going. And what you find is that the distribution ain't going the other way. It's only going in one direction. And yes, the average has certainly moved to the right. But the distribution has broadened, and the tails of the distribution are reaching four and five sigma at probabilities that were unheard of decades, a few decades ago. And these are what we're calling the heat waves. And if you look at the geographical map of where this is happening, it's, that is unpredictable. It's not that the global has, has, has not warmed. It has warmed, but these hot spots, we had one in 2012 in, in Midwest. We had a few years ago, we had in Moscow, in Europe, and it's like a bubble in a carpet. It happens over here, then it shows up somewhere else. We can't predict it because we don't fully understand climate change. But we do understand the first law of, first law of thermodynamics, then there's more energy coming in, less going out, things warm up. And these tails of the distribution, and this is where it is lost in the averages, the tails of the distribution have a disproportionate effect on our lives than the average, because it affects a livestock, it affects agriculture, 
food, etc. And that and water, living in California, that's a big deal. And this is the real issue that we're going to face in the future because of this data, that the, the, the direction of this distribution. So it's important to step back for a moment and ask the question, if you look at how much CO2 we have emitted since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, because the life of the CO2 molecule is on the order of a few hundred years. So the carbon dioxide that we were emitting when James Watt was inventing his, his steam engine are probably still there. Some of it has been absorbed in the oceans, mostly in the oceans, but much of it is still there. It's like a big capacitor. So how much CO2 have we emitted since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, the cumulative? And I'll give you some rough numbers. So cumulative CO2 emissions since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, right? How much is it? And it's roughly about a trillion tons. Then you ask the question, based on the known reserves of fossil fuel today, known reserves, note that this reserves keeps on increasing because we are discovering more. But let's say we know how much we have today, and if we take all those fossil fuels and just burn it, how much more can we emit today? That's the next question. How much more CO2 can we emit based on known fossil fuel reserve? And the answer is about 3 trillion tons. So three times more. Then you ask the question, the first trillion tons took 250 years to emit. How long will it take to emit 3 trillion tons, the next 3 trillion, based on our economic growth, based on business as usual? and the number comes out to be 75 to 100 years. So three times more in one third the time, which is almost 10x factor. And then you ask the question, those three trillion tons of carbon that are there in fossil fuel, how much is it worth? Right? Let's talk about economics, let's talk about business, economic growth, how much is it worth? And that's about tens of trillions of dollars. And this is where the dilemma comes in. Because people are often asked the question, the, or society is given the option, should we keep those tens of trillions of dollars in the ground and not use it for economic growth because we want to save the environment? Or should we take those tens of trillions of dollars from the ground, use it for exponential economic growth, and just to hell with the environment? That's the option that is given. And my friends, that is just a false choice because it does not take into account people like you out here thinking and innovating and coming up with better solutions. And this is best put um, in forward in a saying by the former oil minister of Saudi Arabia, the Stone Age did not end because we ran out of stones. Because we transitioned to better solution and those better solutions comes from research in science and engineering and technology and innovation. Innovations in technology, innovations in finance, innovations in business, all lined up and aligned. And that's when you have the freight train going. And that has not happened yet. So my former boss and I wrote a paper on this, on how do you create a sustainable energy future in aligning these, these technology innovations with other finance and other innovations. And I'm going to say a little bit about that. When you're talking about energy, we have to talk about cost, and we have to talk about scale. We have to talk about economics, learning curves. So let me present how this works. So if you have any technology, look at this technology, the horse carriage. It is a learning curve. And over time, the cost went down, the performance went up, we had better wheels, we had stronger horses, and at scale, it, it went down a learning curve. Any technology, whether it's transistors to horse carriages, all of these follow a learning curve. And at the early stages, you have technology innovation, someone, someone figured out a wheel, someone figured out you know, how to put the horse harness and all that. And then you have to scale things. Because without scale, it doesn't matter because energy touches every people, every one. So you've got to scale. And at the end, there is at the final, at the downstream, there's business, there's deployment, there's money to be made. 
So this is how it works. And what is really important to note is that you can take any technology, whether it's lithium-ion batteries or you can, there's always a learning curve. Now, you can go down a learning curve and that's your business as usual. But as we know, historically, and especially now that I'm you know, in Michigan, you all know this, that that is not what we have today. So something happened in between, and there was an amazing amount of innovation through R&D, but there were breakthroughs in technology that created entirely new learning curves. And there were multiple shots at the goal. There were different kinds of automobiles that were created. Not all of them succeeded. Some of them failed. But one of them scaled, it was Model T. And that scaled and became better and cheaper and cleaner than the previous technology. And that, that created an entirely new learning curve that we know today. And that was disruptive in the best sense of the word because it became cheaper and better for the people and gave people a better option. And so the goal of ARPA-E was to create this new, is to create these new learning curves. You're going down a, a usual incremental improvement, better wheels, better horses, et cetera, but how about disrupting it in the best sense of the word by making it cheaper and better? And that's the job of the engineer and the scientist to figure out how to make it cheaper and better without waiting for policy. Policy is great. But what if it doesn't happen? What happens if you don't have a carbon price? Should we just stop and go do other things? No. It's our job to innovate to make it cheaper and better. But for this, and this is where, this is technology, but to scale it, you need money. And I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna give you a tax policy talk out here, but I just wanna point out that this needs financing. And when you look at different kinds of projects out here, you'll have, you'll see that when you go down this road of scale, the amount of money that you need increases by orders of magnitude, and the time it takes it also increases. So this is not like software, and it's strange for me to say that coming from Google. It's not like software. In the energy business, it takes time because it's capital intensive. And as you go down this, it takes money. So access to long-term, low-cost capital, extremely important. And so this is when I say that the job of the policy is to enable the technology, align the technology innovation with financial innovations, and of course, you need access to markets. And this is where, mar whether it's global markets out here or markets across the world, the access to those markets is very, very critical. So in energy business, it's important to innovate technologically, but it's not just technology. You have to align the other things as well. And sometimes those things are not lined up and technology goes somewhere else. So it's, it's really important to look at the whole thing. Now I'll talk about one, I cannot talk about energy in the United States without talking about shale gas. Because shale gas, the R&D for that started in the 1980s. People think it's a recent thing, it's not. It started in the 1980s when people thought it was a completely crazy thing. And it was disruptive because everything was going down a current learning curve and someone said, the let's try shale, there's a lot of hydrocarbons trapped out there and let's extract it. And people thought, thought that this is disruptive, this is crazy, but the government at that time invested because no one was willing to take the risk. And that's how it happened. And today we have shale gas, and I'm gonna tell you a little bit about that. This is one of the most disruptive, not only in the United States, the rest of the world has probably 10 times more shale. Uh, United States has a lot of hydrocarbons in our shale reserves, and we're just tapping into it right now. I'll t say a little bit about the science and engineering issues, but let me just also show where else it's there. The largest shale reserves are in China. And when China starts extracting, they don't have the infrastructure yet to extract shale. Once they start extracting shale gas at scale and at cost, which they've just started to do, this is a game changer geopolitically. Because now they have access to oil and shale that otherwise they would have depended from other people. And I can talk about it later on if you want. So how is this extracted? You go down about a couple of miles deep down where you reach the shale which is very impermeable rock. And in the past when people were drilling for oil, they used to just drill through it and get to the sandstone because that's much more porous and oil under pressure would come up. But the shale is now the source now, so they had to go horizontally and because the permeability is so low, they had to fracture it. 
under high pressure. And that's how the permeability went up, and the gas and the oil now come under pressure will come out. Now this, is a, this problem, well, we, we are enjoying uh, the benefits of that right now. This is not a done deal. Let me explain why. There's a lot of engineering still to be done. So if you look at this on the left-hand side, this curve, this is the extraction rate, volume flow rate, as a function of time. And each of these are individual wells. So when you actually drill a well, it peaks and then it exponentially goes down. And over time, the peaks have moved up. That means we have learned more and more, we have become better at it, and so we can extract more in the peak. But if you ask the people who are actually doing in this business, you said, what, what about the tail? No one has a clue of how this tail is going to go, how long this tail is going to be, and what's the uncertainty in this? Because they don't understand the science and the engineering of what's going on. Let me give you an example of this. This is what a shale rock looks like. It has pores on the order of 10 to 100 nanometers under pressure. There's a layer of hydrocarbon called kerogen, long chain hydrocarbons that are there. The natural gas, which is methane as short chain hydrocarbons, are adsorbed on this layer. It follows Langmuir isotherms, which is like monolayer adsorption. And the pressure opens up this hydrocarbon bubble out there, which is, creates the permeability. So the solid mechanics of this and the fluid mechanics are coupled because at 10 to 100 nanometers, the mean free path of molecules is on the order of about 10 to 100 nanometers. So it transitions from Knudsen flow to viscous flow in this regime. And, and there's coupling with the solid mechanics. And all the simulation models that are used in the wells today do not have that coupling today. But we're still extracting. So my point, the bottom line is that if someone is interested in looking at this, there's some serious science and engineering that needs to be done to be able to efficiently extract and reduce the cost to increase the production rate of shale gas in our reserves today. But one of the things, consequences of abundant and low cost shale gas is the fact that our electricity production due to natural gas has gone up significantly. It used to be, even about five or six years ago, that 50% of the electricity was being produced from coal in the United States, and natural gas was 20%. It's about equal, 35% or so today. And that has been displaced, and it, our carbon emissions have gone down. That has been displaced purely because of economic reasons. And so if you look at the cost of electricity production, and as I said, cost and scale is everything in energy, the five cents a kilowatt hour is what the bar is, is lowered, has been lowered now because of natural gas. And these are because natural gas is low cost, the feedstock, and the combined cycle turbines, which are about 60 plus percent efficient, has really brought down the cost of electricity production about five cents a kilowatt hour. Then you ask the question, what about the others? And then you find that you have you know, solar is coming down, it's about 10 to 15, and it's coming down at a rate much faster than anything else. Our wind is actually cheaper than coal already. Some of the power purchase agreements are being written at about five cents a kilowatt hour, six cents a kilowatt hour, depending on the region, and it's cheaper than coal. So, and then the others. So this is what is going on. And this is, you know, if you look at the deployment, this is wind, the blue bars, are the cents per kilowatt hour of wind, and the green line is the adoption. And you find there's an exponential, when the cost comes down linearly, the deployment goes up exponentially. And that is what is going on. But this is something, we have to think about this a little bit, because there's a fundamental difference between what I, but between all the other sources of electricity and these ones out here. Those ones all centralized generation thermal power plants whereas these ones are distributed and modular. Now if you think about it, they all have to supply the electricity to the grid. What was the grid designed for? The grid was designed for the centralized generation. So the architecture of the grid is one of the most fundamental infrastructure that we have. If there's no electricity, there is no Google, and there's no nothing. 
that we have. This, there are no lights out here. That infrastructure, that paradigm that has been created is centralized generation, long distance high voltage transmission, medium voltage distribution in the neighborhoods, and then 120 volts, 60 hertz in your home. That's the paradigm, and that architecture, not the devices, the architecture goes back to Tesla and Edison. It's a 100 plus year old architecture, and it's one way power flow from the centralized generation to your homes. Why centralized generation? Because it was just cheaper. Now I'm telling you that the cost of the distributed generation is, go, is reducing. So what about the grid? This is, you know, this is, as I said, are the arteries and veins of the United States. This is a transmission network. So it turns out that there is this architecture and this network has been created for a certain paradigm. And that paradigm is being questioned right now. And this questioning is coming from various sources. I said the architecture is 100 years old, but the devices are not. So let's talk about the devices that are there. It turns out that when you go from high voltage to medium voltage, the drop in voltage is enabled by transformers, right? We all learned this. So these are what they look like. Let's talk about the age of the transformers. The expected lifespan of these transformers, this is a big substation transformer, the expected lifespan is 40 years. The average age of these transformers in the United States is 42 years. So we're at minus two on the average. And the backlog for these transformers is six to 24 months. That's where we are today. That's the infrastructure. In fact, we're almost on a house of cards, not the political one. This is literally house of cards. Let me talk about cyber physical security. People talk about cyber security. It is cyber physical. And the best way to explain it is to tell you about an incident that happened. And this happened in our neighborhood. In just south of San Jose, there's a Highway 101 that goes from San Jose to Morgan Hill towards Santa Barbara. There is a substation, PG&E, called the Metcalf substation, uh, right on that highway. You can actually see it. All the transmission lines come there, and it distributes electricity to south of San Jose. And on April 16th, 2 a.m. in the morning, some gunmen took a bunch of guns and shot about 122 shots exactly where they needed to shoot at the radiators of these transformers. And the radiators is because they would drain out the cooling oil, the mineral oil that is used for cooling. This transformer, so they would trip. Of the 14 transformers, they probably had infrared cameras they figured out which one the active ones, and they shot at those. And they leaked out 50,000 gallons of cooling oil, brought down the whole substation, but 15 minutes before that, they went and cut the fiber optic and telephone lines so that 911 was disabled. Shocking. But you know, no one heard about it. Even living in the Bay Area, we did not hear about it. You know why? Because it was the night of the Boston Marathon bombing. And we still haven't caught these guys yet. And I've been collecting data, whatever is declassified, unclassified data, and it turns out the amount of electricity outages that we have due to sabotage is only going up. And due to weather related is also going up. So this is the state of affairs that we live in. Then there's an economic driver for change. This is what is going on. If you look at the red curve out there, that's the cost of electricity production from rooftop solar, okay, that is going down in cents per uh, dollars per kilowatt hour. The horizontal lines are the retail electricity price that you pay your utility in your different parts of the country. The top one is Hawaii, it's expensive. The next one is California, uh, and the, the last one is average you know, um, across the United States. So this is what is going on. If the cost of electricity that you produce from a rooftop solar is lower than the retail electricity that you pay your utility, there's a problem. You're gonna switch then at some point. And you can see the adoption of solar uh, PV. It's small still, but it's going this, the early part of the S-curve. The same thing is happening in lithium ion batteries. That cost has come down by a factor of two or three in the last few years, and the adoption of electric vehicles is going up 
primarily driven by electric vehicles, and now Tesla has a deal with SolarCity to provide storage for homes to back up the solar in your home. And so that is what is, that's the intersection that is happening. And if you think this is small, let me give you some data. This is the load curve in California. The whole of California load curve looks like this. There's a little peak at about noon, then it flattens, and then 4 p.m., between 4 p.m. and 6 p.m., when people go home, there's a peak, there's a ramp up in electricity, and then it goes down. So this is, and this is about on the order of anywhere from 20 to 30 gigawatts of electricity. This is all of California load. This is what is going on, and this is what is predicted by the California Independent System Operator. This load between 12 and 4 is going to go down, and then at the ramp up, the ramp rate is going to be higher. It's going to go like this, and this is called the duck's belly, because this is the duck out here. The duck is getting fatter. It's also called the peaking duck. So you got this duck's belly out there, and the ramp rate is going to be 150 to 250, 200 megawatts a minute. So they ask the question, what's going on? Between four, noon and 4 p.m., the load is going down, and the California Independent System Operator, Cal ISO, has excess electricity that don't know what to do with. This negative load. And Cal ISO is now thinking of negative pricing. That means they will pay someone to take the electricity away because they've got too much electricity. The reason that is happening is rooftop solar. Because once you hit the noon, um, and because you're using your own electricity, you need less electricity. It's negative load. And that is making the grid potentially unstable in the future. So imagine if you had storage in your home, and you could, you could shift this, and you get paid for it because of negative pricing. That's the business opportunity that a lot of people are looking at right now. So there's a paradigm that is changing in our 100-year-old grid, and this is happening for the first time in 100 years. This is the paradigm that we have had so far. You have an independent system operator that balances the grid, provides electricity to the utility. The utility does not balance. It generates electricity, gives it to the, the wholesale market, then buys from the wholesale, and distributes it in the retail way to your homes. And that's the one-way electricity flow. That's the current paradigm. The way these markets run, the large wholesale market runs in a day-ahead market, 15-minute market. It's not real-time stock market, but nevertheless, it's about a, it's, it gets close. But it's, it changes daily, the pricing. What do you pay the utility are these rates. This is PG&E rates that I pay. And tier one is 13 cents, tier two is 15 cents, tier three is 32 cents a kilowatt hour. And I have no idea when I cross over from tier two to tier three, I double my electricity rate. This is, there's no transparency. And there's no correlation between this rate and the market rates, and the wholesale market rates. This is the paradigm. So the paradigm of centralized generation, transmission, distribution has led to this institution and the market structures which all are being questioned at this point. This is an amazing time in the electricity business, in the energy business. So what is going on? What is the shifting paradigm? When your rooftop solar is cheaper than the utility electricity that you buy, guess what's going to happen? You're going to buy electricity from the cheapest sources. You're going to have storage. You have 60 million homes produce, which has natural gas going to it, but no one is really using for electricity. People will generate electricity at marginal cost of three or four cents a kilowatt hour. And there will be communication between the information is easily flowable right now. We haven't even touched that technology in the electricity business, and there will be dynamic pricing going on. So this is a shifting paradigm. And one of the big things out here that is still developing is storage, which is a game changer. So we looked at this in a, in a grid scale storage. So what are the technologies out there? What's the cheapest way to store electricity? It turns out the cheapest way is pumped hydro. You just pump water up a dam. And that the levelized cost, amortized over time, is about two to two and a half cents a kilowatt hour. The capital cost, the upfront cost, is $100 a kilowatt hour. That's what it costs. And then we looked at other, well, you can only do pumped hydro in so many places. So what about the other technologies? And the others initially, were you know, about $1,000 a kilowatt hour, but a factor of five to 10 higher. So we put out a challenge to the scientific community. Can you create storage 
technologies, stationary storage technologies that are $100 a kilowatt hour, but that could be deployed anywhere. And out of that came amazing technologies looking, and mostly from universities. City College is de developing a zinc manganese oxide batteries um, from Arizona State, rechargeable zinc air batteries. Zinc air is used for, your, uh, for hearing aids, but they're generally not rechargeable. But this, they're trying to make it rechargeable, call, and this is a startup company of fluidic energy. And they are now deploying it in Indonesia, in, in, in other nations, because they, have, they need backup power. So they're pi running pilots out there. This Primus Power in the Bay Area, zinc-based battery. This lithium-ion flow battery coming out of MIT, which spun out into a company called 24M. And these are lithium-ion batteries in a completely different architecture. And there's a tremendous amount of innovation that is now being spawned. And hope not all of them, these are the disruptive li new learning curves. Not all of them will succeed. They'll have to compete. But the goal is that if one succeeds, they'll be disruptive in the best sense of the word. Power electronics, amazing stuff that is going on. I won't go into the, too much of the details. You know, these are devices that can take you from DC to AC, AC to DC, go up in voltage, go down in voltage, control the phase angle between your current and voltage electronically. And today, the way voltage up and down is done is using the same transformers that were attacked. These are typically about 8,000 pounds. They operate at 60 hertz. As I said, the, the age is pretty high, and you need a crane to install it. And when I was an RP, we asked the question, could we do better? Could we do it electronically? And we funded a bunch of groups. I'll just give you one example. This is a silicon carbide transistor. It's a power transistor that can handle 15 kilovolts of, of electrical power dropped across a 200 micron thick layer of silicon carbide. 100 amps, so that's about 1.5 megawatts. It can handle 200 ohms in a single transistor and can run it not 50 or 60 hertz, 50 kilohertz. And if you increase the frequency, your inductor size and your capacitors all go down in size, and that transistor becomes the heart of a larger system which can convert power and do much more than go up and go down in voltage than what a transformer can do. And this is some really fundamental changes that are likely to happen. And of course, for this, you need magnets. Ma magnets, big research, underfunded. People mostly funded research in magnets for data storage. But for these applications, you need soft magnets, not hard magnets. And you, if you go up in frequency, the losses go up because the domain walls move and you have eddy currents. So you need to make an insulator and you need to make single domain particles, nanoparticles, all consolidated into a large magnet. It's non-trivial, but that's where the research has to go. Let me talk a little bit about transportation. This is where the fuel consumption is in the United States. Almost 60% in light duty vehicles, 22% in trucks, and the rest, you know, and distributed across air, water, etc. The predominant fuel, as you all know, is gasoline and diesel. There are other fuels, natural gas, biofuels, electricity, etc. And the predominant powertrain is, of course, the internal combustion engine and the transmission. Of course, there are other powertrains, but they have, they are, they're being tried out now. And of course, there's light weighting, which all the auto companies are looking at. The question, so I was, I co-chaired for a little while a report from the National Petroleum Council, which involved all the auto companies the oil and gas companies, et cetera, and the electricity, utilities, et cetera, to come up, so what is the future of transportation? How do we reduce, in fact, the question was, how do we reduce the carbon emissions from transportation by 50% by 2050? And what came out of that was very interesting. Number one is that today we have only predominantly one option. We're likely to have other options in the future, which is not surprising. But what was surprising is that the cost per mile is likely to go down, which is a really good thing. More options and cheaper. And so if I look at the trends, and you will know this, many of you will know this being uh, in Michigan, is the future, or some of the trends, is fuel flexibility. Can we create powertrains with different fuels? In fact, we are seeing the trucking industry now transitioning slowly in the early stages to LNG long-haul trucking, and the infrastructure is also being created because there's business 
It's, it makes money. Powertrain electrification, this is already happening as we speak. I'm not, this is not a surprise. Light weighting primarily driven by, by you know, electrification as well as cafe standards, et cetera. But one thing that is underutilized is, and I drive 100 miles a day to work, and I see this, that almost every car has one person in it. In terms of an asset, if you think about it, when we own a car, 96% of the time it's being parked. We're using it only 4% of the time, and we're paying a lot of money for it. And I think we'll see a trend using information technology and the right kind of incentives for utilizing the asset. You don't need to, you need to go from A to B. Do you really need to own a car? And I think we are finding a lot of younger generation going in those directions as well. But in terms of electricity, electrification, we're seeing this. You're, in 2008, the cost of lithium-ion batteries was about $1,000 a kilowatt hour. And today, it is here. It's in 2012, it's about $500. Today, it's about $400 to $450 a kilowatt hour. It's going down. And once it reaches, and it's projected to reach about $100 a kilowatt hour, $100 to $160 a kilowatt hour um, in 2020, 2022, and if that happens, the range and the cost are comparable to that of internal combustion engine cars. And this is without subsidies, and you'll see a lot of adoption, and we're seeing the early stages of the ESCO. When I was at RPE, we sort of focused on that, and instead of just not looking at lead acid or nickel metal hydride, lithium ion, we put out the challenge, can you be disruptive to today's lithium ion battery? Because to create entirely new learning curves. And out of that, we put out this challenge out here. Out of that came out all of these technologies and all these startups coming out of universities that are now going from magnesium ion, zinc air batteries, advanced lithium ion, lithium sulfur, and lithium air. I won't go into the science of these, but there's a tremendous amount of understanding of the mechanics and the electrochemistry of these materials and the right kind of architecture that needs really good, solid science and engineering. Let me end with a little bit of biofuels because people seem to have forgotten that, but we have to close the carbon cycle at some point. So sunlight to fuels, how do we do that? What we have done so far is use photosynthesis. And in photosynthesis, you capture carbon dioxide from the air, you water, you split the water, and you make hydrocarbons or carbohydrates. And it all follows what is called the Calvin-Benson cycle. The Calvin-Benson cycle, Melvin Calvin from Berkeley uh, discovered it. And whether you use algae or, or sugarcane or cellulosic or corn, it's all of that. And we, have, we can now make all kinds of you know, chemicals or fuels out of it. We have invested a lot into this. Um, various forms, whether it's, whether it's uh, corporate research or, or government-funded research. Then there's, of course, the other, the non-photosynthetic part of chemical catalysis, whether you make syngas and then you make fuels through that, or the Joint Center for Artificial Photosynthesis is trying to do is can you emulate photosynthesis artificially and thereby make hydrocarbons out of this. And the idea is that this could be much more efficient than the Calvin-Benson cycle because Calvin-Benson cycle is less than 1% efficient. And that really matters because less than 1% means you need a lot of land, you need a lot of water, and it costs a lot because of this 1% efficiency. Imagine solar cell at 1% efficiency. You'll need a lot of that, and it costs money. The other one that had not been tried out, and I'll say a little bit about that, um, in, is what, are called, what we call electrofuels. And this is biological catalysis, not chemical catalysis, biological. And the idea is to broaden the concept of photosynthesis into other things. So these are non-biological organisms. Many of them are in the deep ocean vents that have no sunlight, but they're using oxidation, redox reactions, oxidizing iron from plus two to plus three, grabbing that electron and actually making bonds, chemical carbon-carbon bonds. And the idea is the following, that you take these organisms and you can take any of these reducing equivalents, whether it's hydrogen, electrons, ammonia, iron going from plus two to plus three, et cetera, or hydrogen sulfide, which is found in crude oil. Then you can use other cycles besides Calvin-Benzel, which, which are much more efficient than Calvin-Benson cycle 
to make hydrocarbon bonds, carbon-carbon bonds. And finally, you can make, if you can get, do that, you can make fuels, you can make bioproducts, et cetera. And it turns out that no one had ever tried this approach to make biofuels. So we said, this is pretty risky, let's invest in it. And in two years, lo and behold, people made the first biofuel without any sunlight. And this was made at night. And this now is a new route to biofuel synthesis. I'm saying this because a lot of people say that this is impossible. And you just, for the younger people out here, if it does not violate the laws of nature, go ahead and try it out. I'll give you another one, an amusing one. This is a, we know the corn is not very efficient way of making biofuels because the energy density is just too low. So we put out a challenge to create plants, to engineer plants to make oil directly at an energy density and cost that is cost competitive without subsidies. And so I'll give you one example of that. We all know that algae can make oil. We know that. But algae has other problems because it needs water, it, needs, it gets infected, et cetera. So this group at Berkeley said, that, why don't we take the metabolic pathway of algae that actually makes oil, that's the most relevant thing, and put that in a plant like tobacco that grows in bad soil. So the idea is that you will just take the leaves of tobacco and squeeze it and oil comes out. I said, this is amazing. Because if this works, you'll have big oil and big tobacco come together and save the world. <laughs> and believe it or not, it actually worked. It's working right now. It hasn't scaled, of course, but it's possible. And I'm gonna end my talk with some famous or infamous predictions of the past when people said, this is bogus, this will never work. And it actually did. Well, this is from our scientific community. Lord Kelvin said, radio has no future. X-rays will prove to be a hoax and heavier than air, flying machines are impossible. Lord Kelvin was opinionated, but he was wrong. But he was not the only one. He managed to convince Wilbur Wright, who in 1901 said that man will not fly for 50 years. I'm glad he didn't take himself too seriously. Or Orville Wright had more influence on his brother. But perhaps the best way to capture what I'm talking about is the quote by Arthur C. Clarke. Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And if you think about it, I'll come back to the, my previous argument. If you think about what the world was like when the United States was being created, what we have today is magic to those people. And it is really up to all of you to create the magic for the 21st century. So thank you very much. Happy to answer some questions. Thank you. Nobody learns by listening to someone tell them how to do something. Everybody learns by doing. You can watch video after video about how to ski, 